So uh, this, this is the first lecture in our three parts series on financial markets and the monetary sphere. So today Natalia Natui, PhD candidate in development studies, will be talking about the role of the financial sector in economic growth. Uh, the next lecture will be held by Jens Kluster, Kluster, I never know how to pronounce his last name, who will be talking about monetary policy implementation and how commercial banks and central banks work. And then the lecture after that will be held by Domna on financial crises and bubbles. Uh, so that will then conclude, there will have a lecture after that, but that will conclude the, the, the part, about a three-part uh, series about financial markets. And with that, I uh, leave it to Natalia. Okay, thank you. Okay, so... I was told to summarize my argument very briefly in the beginning. So, so what I'm going to be talking about today is the neoclassical view of the financial sector and development versus alternative views. And very briefly, even though the ideal financial sector in neoclassical economics is a liberalized one, the historical experiences of successfully developed countries have actually been exactly the opposite. That is, a heavily controlled financial sector in the service of an industrial policy in order to promote economic growth. Um, so I thought we should start by discussing a bit what the purpose of the financial system is actually in regards to the economy. Um, because even though it seems like it may be an obvious one, it's actually not. And there's actually a great amount of debate over even this most basic starting point. Um, so most mainstream economists would begin with saying that one of the jobs of the financial sector is to accumulate capital from savers, which can then be invested. The reason I put a question mark on that one is that this point is actually debated because some Keynesian economists might actually argue that investment precedes the savings and not the other way around as this implies. Um, but actually, Jens is going to talk more about this aspect in the next lecture, so I'm just going to leave it all together in my lecture, because it will take too long and will be repetitive. But um, what I'm going to do instead is focus on the second role of the financial sector, which is the allocation of resources. So we can say that in this regard, the role of the financial sector is to allocate resources to the most effective, and notice that I don't say efficient, most effective and for the purposes of economic growth or development. Um, now, this is quite a vague statement, and I, I know it, it doesn't say anything about the types of financial structure or the institutions that are desirable, and that debate is actually going to be the subject of the lecture. Um, so at this point, we should note that the type of financial system we have can either disrupt or support the process that I just mentioned, the allocation of resources in order to create economic growth. Um, so now let's take a look at what the various theories say about what types of financial institutions and regulations and governmental roles lead to either of the outcomes. So before I start outlining this huge literature, I'll give a very quick disclaimer, which is that due to time constraints, of course my explanation is going to be somewhat of a caricature of this literature, but I encourage you to read some of the papers that Ivan will, or the references that Ivan, that I'll give to Ivan, that he put online, um, and then you can get a more nuanced picture of the literature. Um, so, the neoclassical literature on finance and economic development started as mainly an empirical literature in the early 90s, which used mainly cross-country regressions to show a positive association between financial sector growth, that's basically what they term financial deepening, it means the kind of size of the financial sector, and economic growth. And this literature has been flourishing for over 20 years now, with a wide variety of theoretical and empirical studies using very sophisticated methods, um, to try and establish some kind of causal relationship running from financial deepening to financial sector growth. Sorry, from financial deepening to economic growth. Um, 
given that it's a huge literature and specifies so many different channels and mechanisms through which this economic growth occurs through the financial sector, I won't have time to go into all of them, but I've, I've put up a list here that, that you can look at. Um, I'll just say quickly that one important thing to note is that the basic mechanism in all of these is through an efficient market-based market allocation of resources. Um, and the last one, I'm not going to talk too much about that in this lecture. Um, it's basically what the governor will be speaking about in her lecture, so it's very important, but I'm going to skip it. And all I'll say for now is that countries with a controlled domestic financial system will normally have heavy capital controls um, on their foreign influence. Okay, um, so this literature doesn't really deal very explicitly with the role of the government, but when it does, its ideal role is seen as only to set the kind of necessary policy and institutional preconditions for financial deepening and to provide a financial safety net to deal with crisis. Um, that's kind of referring to bailing out the banks and this kind of thing. Um, but following on from this, when the government intervenes excessively, according to this literature, it prevents growth due to create, because this creates distortions in the free market price allocation process. And on top of that, the government's provision of this safety net can also cause financial crisis due to moral hazards. Um, therefore, the policy recommendations that come out of this literature would be things kind of designed to minimize the allocative influence of the government, not, influ not minimize the regulatory influence necessarily, but the allocative influence, um, and kind of allow the market mechanism to work. So this would be stuff like domestic financial deregulation, privatization of banks, um, capital account liberalization, removal of interest rate controls, and uh, policies to develop capital markets, that's stock and bond markets. Um, and these policies generally together are termed financial liberalization. Um, I should point out that in, in the most recent post-crisis literature in, in, this, um, in this line of thought, um, they have become slightly more critical of this stance. They say now that financial sector growth beyond a certain threshold level in advanced economies can actually have a detrimental effect on growth or no effect on growth. But, but they still don't actually question these the basic mechanisms that I listed in the previous slide. Um, okay, so before we go on to discuss alternative approaches, I just want to quickly go through some of the assumptions that this literature relies on. Um, and still continues to rely on even in the post-crisis environment. So one of the core assumptions is the efficient markets hypothesis, the EMH as I've written there. Um, this is the belief that financial markets allocate resources efficiently, which means that prices reflect all information both quickly and accurately. So those are the two key points. Um, relatedly, the assumption in this literature behind how economic growth occurs is that it comes through a market-based allocation of resources. Um, I'm not going to elaborate on, on this point because it's been already the subject of two previous lectures, but I guess you guys already know that. Um, but given these two assumptions, in that regard, it's assumptions about the role of the government as merely a facilitator or a provider of infrastructure are also extremely problematic, um, especially when we know from previous lectures that the state has actually played a major role in actively promoting economic development historically. Um, so apart from these problematic assumptions, there are a number of other things this literature has been criticized for. Aside from numerous methodological critiques, which I won't get into because it will be really boring and technical. Um, the one thing I will say is that it looks at financial sector size as the independent variable in a very unsophisticated way. So 
The financial deepening indicators, they're usually things like uh, bank lending to GDP, stock market turnover to GDP, market capitalization. Um, these are not really able to account for the institutional differences in the financial system. So what I mean by this is that, for example, an expansion in the size of public development banks implies something completely different from for economic growth than the expansion in, say, trading activities of hedge funds or asset managers or other types of investment funds. So while both of them mean an increase in the size of the financial sector, they, they actually <coughs> imply something completely different. And one might actually be good for economic growth and one might actually be bad for economic growth. Um, so focusing purely on the size of the financial sector cannot really account for this kind of institutional diversity. Okay, so now we will start talking about the alternative theory. So in many alternative schools of economic thought, like Keynesian, post-Keynesian, institutional, Marxist, the EMH assumption is actually rejected. Um, there is no belief that financial markets, left to their own devices, will always allocate resources in the most optimal way. In these theories, there is no such thing as a true market price or an intrinsic value of a financial asset as there is as it's implied in the EMH. Um, now, I won't have time to go into so much detail about Keynes, but it's really interesting and really important, so I would encourage you to read chapter 12 of the general theory, but it'll take me very long if I go through it in detail. But I'll just quickly say that in, um, so in Keynes' theory of stock market behavior, due to fundamental uncertainty, which is best actually explained by this quote, which I, I won't read out, but you guys can read that, um, there's a role for speculators in determining prices, and this means that the price of the financial market will not necessarily reflect any kind of intrinsic value or allocate resources optimally. Similarly, in institutionalist theory, so that's institutional economics, prices are seen as social conventions, and then see the rest of the quote, but what it basically means is that prices are seen as social norms. So, rather than being any kind of true price or true market determined price, they're just they're social norms. Um, so of course, this kind of thinking changes dramatically the scope for the role of the government. If it's no longer assumed that markets left to their own devices will allocate resources in the best way possible for economic growth, then actually they need to be made to allocate resources in that way. So that's where we come to finance and industrial policy. So this is actually exactly this historically important role that the financial sector has played that the neoclassical literature completely neglects. Um, here I'm going to define industrial policy as a policy that attempts to affect the evolution of specific industries through state intervention in order to affect national efficiency and growth. Um, I'm not going to elaborate so much on this because already Yostin and Vasiliki did two whole lectures on that. Um, but in this view, the role of the financial sector is to support industrial policy. And this is done through providing basically low-cost credit to priority sectors. Um, and it's important to note that that's not through a market-based allocation of resources, but rather through state control. And this kind of financial system has historically been termed financial repression um, by pro-liberalization economists in debates that were happening in the 70s. And it's usually taken to have some kind of negative connotation, but I'm just the way I'm going to use it in this lecture just means a government-controlled financial system. Um, um, okay, so so this li line of thinking actually brings us back to the work of two famous economists, Schumpeter and Gershenkron. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of them, but I'll just quickly go through their kind of main lines of thought. Um, <coughs> according to Schumpeterian economic theory, the banking system 
promotes technological innovation by funding the most innovative enterprises that have the best prospects of success. So in this way, banks can become entrepreneurs in order to direct credit towards those projects that best fulfill long-run development goals. Um, According to the Gershwin-Kahn hypothesis, the more backward a country, he means economically less developed a country, um, the stronger the institution required to promote economic development. And since private investors are too risk averse to undertake the kind of large scale investments that are necessary for economic development, government ownership of banks can instead be used to fund these projects. So, Classical development theory kind of combines these two ways of thinking. It takes from Schumpeter his thinking on the role of the banking system or the financial sector more generally, and from Gershenkron the role, of the importance of the state in intervening in economic growth. So they use these two theories to kind of justify state control of the financial sector, so that the state instead becomes the Schumpeterian entrepreneur described above through controlling the financial sector. Um, okay, so, so now I'm, I'm going to discuss a bit so that we can see in, in concrete terms how countries have historically utilized methods of financial repression in the context of an overall industrial policy in order to promote economic growth. Um, I'll talk about two specific cases so that we can get an idea for the, the different types of policy tools that have been used and how they've been used. But of course, many, many countries have used these type of methods. And I mean, I, I'll put some readings, I'll give some readings to Ivan for more, more case studies because all countries have utilized these tools in, in very different ways. So I'm going to discuss a bit about Japan and Taiwan. Um, so in Japan, during its rapid development phase, which was in the post-war period, you had a financial system dominated by what's called the main banks. And these are, these are basically large commercial banks, which have long-term relationships with the largest firms. Um, and though these banks were privately owned, they were, the government played a very important role, actually, in, in determining the overall financial structure and how these banks operated. Um, through limiting competition in banking, using entry barriers, using credit ceilings, and, and other regulations. So the capital markets, which, which are supposed to be a source of long-term credit, according to economic theory, were actively prevented, actually, from developing by the government. And instead, there existed publicly or privately owned long-term credit banks. So I'll call them LTCBs. Um, and these were there to provide credit for fixed investments, so to provide long-term credit for fixed investments. And they were there kind of instead of the corporate bond market. Um, so the difference between these and commercial banks are their funding sources. While commercial banks are funded by individual deposits, like from you and me or an individual company, um, these, which that en enables them to lend only short term, these long-term credit banks were funded by issues of bonds. So issues of, they would issue their own bond. And given that I had a much longer maturity than I might want to keep my deposit in a bank, that gave them a much longer term funding source, which enabled them to make longer term loans without as much risk as the commercial banks would have been taking. So the LTCBs actually played a vital role in rapid development by providing funds to strategic sectors which were designated by the government. So in the case of Japan, this would be power generation, steel, coal, fertilizer, shipbuilding, and so on. And, um, and I mean, so that's basically an industrial policy. And, and these banks would also provide joint loans with the main banks. So they, they had kind of a cooperative role with, with the commercial banks. In the case of Taiwan, um, during its rapid development phase, which is the post-war period to the 80s, um, the government actually intervened even more extensively than in Japan, using tools of financial repression to influence the amount and the composition of investment um, in order to, again, implement its sectoral industrial policies. 
So in Taiwan, the banks were all actually government owned. And the advantage of government ownership of a bank, or rather the, the reason for government ownership of a bank, is that it's easier for the government in this case to, to direct banks to lend to the areas it thinks is important. I mean, of course, you can, you can still do this when the banks are private, as was the case in, in Japan. It's just that it requires a much stronger regulatory capacity, which Taiwan did not have at the time. Um, I mean, and then, of course, government banks can also lend to far higher risk industries than private banks because the government can bail them out if necessary. So they don't run really on a short-term profit motive like private banks. Um, the government also controls the interest rate structure in, in Taiwan. And this means basically that interest rates for different things were not market determined, but rather they were just set by the government. Um, so, for example, the government would set interest rates for important things like the deposit rate or for lending rates to particular important industries. Um, and all of the banks in the economy would have to go according to this prescribed interest rate. And then you also had directed credit schemes. So these were kind of special credit schemes that offered credit at subsidized rates, so lower than what would have been the normal market rate or the normal set interest rate um, to special sectors that the government wanted to promote. So in Taiwan, it would be the export sector because the government wanted to promote exports. Um, at some points, the banks would even receive lending targets for, say, 6 to 12 specific industries, which were deemed priority sectors by the planning agency and the central bank, and then they had targets that they had to lend a certain amount to these industries. So that was a way of kind of guaranteeing credit to what the government thought were the important industries. Um, in addition, there were also some funds going directly from the government, either through some kind of government-created special purpose fund or just direct disbursements from the government for major ISI, that's import substitution industrialization projects, or for SOEs in various sectors. But the important thing to note is that it's... So it's not actually only some East Asian late developers that have utilized these methods, but it's actually much more widespread than that. And just in this example, even many of today's advanced economies have used some of these methods during their industrialization phase and, and actually even in the present day. So in France, for example, public development banks played a key historical role in its industrial development. This was obviously much, much before. But whereas in Germany, actually, it's, it's still home to the world's second largest public development bank, the KFW, which was founded after World War II. And since then, it's, it's played a significant role in German economic growth. So here is a list of the main policy tools that I kind of discussed through the empirical examples. I won't go through each of them, but I mean, it's, it's not an exhaustive list by any means. And, um, the point here is actually that there are many, many methods and many different combinations of methods the government can use to influence credit allocation to varying degrees. And of course, I'm not saying that every government should do exactly as Japan or Taiwan. But I think an example that will make it clear is if, if you compare it to what's happening in the UK now, where even though RBS was nationalized, even though the Bank of England's been doing quantitative easing in the name of preserving free markets, they, they still don't put any kind of lending stipulations or regulations on the banks that they have to lend to certain sectors. And a recent statistic from Positive Money shows that only 8% of bank lending in the UK goes to real economy businesses. And that means that the other 92% is going to stuff like property market speculation or into financial markets, and in many cases, financial markets abroad in East Asia causing financial crisis in those countries. Um, okay, so, so, so now, I'll just very briefly, because I, I don't have so much time left, um, 
I'll just discuss a bit the next some of the negative experiences that developing countries have had with, with financial liberalization. So, so since the early 90s, there has been kind of this huge wave of financial liberalization in, in developing countries, and it's been very much promoted by, by IMF and World Bank structural adjustment. Um, so if we look at developing countries that have prematurely liberalized their financial system and tried to develop their capital markets, we can begin to see some common patterns. And I mean, so these are examples of, of the kind of countries we've seen these patterns in, but of course, it's by no means, uh, these are by no means the, the only countries. But also, of course, it's, this is not what's happened in every single country that's liberalized and the order of events has often deferred, but I'll just briefly outline what we've seen now as emerging as a common post-liberalization pattern. Um, so interest rate, li rate liberalization combined with the privatization of commercial banks has often resulted in excessively high real interest rates because remember the government controls interest rates normally to keep them low for certain sectors so if all those controls go away then normally the average real interest rate will rise. Um, and therefore you got waves of bad debts and bank failures. Um, and I mean, th this part especially has been the case in Latin America. Um, this causes the real sector, so sectors of the real economy, to enter a prolonged recession. This then creates a vicious cycle where banks further increase deposit and lending rates to compensate for all of the bad loans that they've made. Um, and as such, these super high, in oh, sorry, and by NPLs, I mean bad loans, like non performing loans. They just mean loans that are going to be defaulted on. Um, so, so very high interest rates will fail to increase savings and also fail to boost investment. Um, then one of the other key patterns is that we've seen a diversion of financial resources from productive to unproductive sectors. And I mean, I'm not saying that before financial liberalization, the allocation of credit would have been perfect by any means. But generally, resources have been diverted from productive sectors like manufacturing or agriculture, where they were kind of forced, at least the government tried to force financial resources to go there before. But they've been diverted especially into consumer finance, speculation on financial markets, and also into the high interest payments on debt, which is actually a result of increased interest rates. So, I mean, that's not to say, of course, that every experience with financial liberalization has been bad. Um, you could contrast these, this kind of liberalization experience with that of the East Asian countries, but which was actually much more controlled, much more slow, and, and occurred at a different phase of economic development, and is generally considered a success. But this, this has been a, a common pattern. Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much. And okay, questions? Yes. Uh, thank you, that was very interesting. Um, so you've shown us um, that it's really important for developing countries to basically have financial repression, as you call it. Um, how much financial, liberal, financial liberalization is necessary for, for advanced economies? What do you think is needed or not needed? Because we're always told that advanced economies need financial liberalization. Yeah, so I guess that's, like, that's the kind of thing that it's, they've started seeing in the, in the mainstream literature now even, but they, they say there's like this threshold level after which Increase like so sorry so financial repression is seen to prevent the financial deepening, and they say that too much financial liberalization will uh, increase the size of the financial sector too much, and that will be a bad thing for advanced countries. But I mean, I don't know. I don't really see it like there's some completely different role of the financial sector in advanced countries. So even though okay, you might maybe you don't want to have like kind of industrialization based industrial policy but I guess
still need to divert credit to productive sectors, right? So, I, I guess in like Europe, for example, it's not like like there was before the financial crisis. There was no shortage of credit. It's just that it was going to the government bond markets and it was going to real estate speculation, whereas maybe it could have gone to like investment in renewables or uh, into R and D or something like that. And I guess like you can see that that's also not something that will just happen naturally through a market-based allocation of resources, even in developed countries. So maybe, I guess, the degree is less than you need it, but, but I, I would personally say you still need some kind of control over your financial sector. Yes? Um, I was wondering to what extent financial repression is a sustainable model of growth, because um, if we look at China as an example, we see that financial repression essentially results in a transfer of wealth from um, households and privately owned firms to state-owned firms who enjoy the benefits of low interest rates and uh, like investment under financial repression. And so that's one of the reasons why we have such a large um, investment share of GDP in China today, and it's one of the fundamental imbalances. So like, could we say that the financial pressure model is thus leads to unsustainable growth, per se? Well, I guess, I mean, so, so that's, yeah, that's like the kind of uh, neoclassical criticism of financial repression. But I guess it depends on, on the growth model, because so the growth model of China might, is very much that it, it wants to develop these massive state-owned enterprises and provide employment and productivity increases to them. So then if that's their development model, then it's not a problem per se that SME, private SMEs are being deprived of credit. I mean, that, that is what happened in Korea and Taiwan. Um, and Japan actually. So, so during their rapid development phases, the small and medium enterprises sector plus consumer credit was was rationed out of the market. And I mean, I guess also with consumer credit, it comes with its own set of problems, as we've seen with the US, with subprime mortgages in the U.S. So, I mean, I I don't know whether it's financial repression per se that's inherently uns unsustainable, or if it's that the government does not keep adapting the methods of financial repression to how its economy is changing. Yes? Uh, yeah, thanks. So um, maybe as a support for, for the whole argument that you, you set up, you could look at the development of the non-standard monetary policy of the European Central Bank during the crisis. Mm -hmm. So they, they started with these uh, long-term refinancing operation programs where they just lend out money cheaply to the financial sector. And the hope was that that would somehow restore uh, 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 lending to the real economy. And uh, so that didn't happen, uh, largely. And instead, as you also put, uh, touched on, it was used in mostly for lending in, in non-productive assets and mm, yeah. uh, sovereign bonds, right? So it had a function in that respect. And now the, uh, uh, these programs are supplemented. So these were the long-term uh, refinancing operations. Now they do the, the TELTRUMS, the targeted long-term refinancing operations. So they're actually, even at the European Central Bank, trying to steer somewhat what this money goes through that they're uh, giving to, to banks. Mm -hmm. and, uh, somewhat along the model of the uh, countries you sketched. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I guess that links with Anne's point as well, that even in, even in developed countries, you might need some kind of direction <coughs> of, of credit. And I mean, so maybe the model of China is not appropriate, but that doesn't mean that you need absolutely no kind of interference and, and where the credit is allocated. Yes. How much pressure do developing countries come under to liberalize their financial markets? And I guess the flip side is how much policy space is there for them to kind of follow the, the kind of heterodox approaches that you covered in the, in the second part of mm, I mean, so I guess, so, so like the, the kind of typical story you hear is that under pressure of the IMF, all of the, the countries liberalized. But I guess 
I mean, in my view at least on that would be that there's of course also some kind of domestic pressure, it's in some, there's some domestic interests for whom it's good that there's financial liberalization. So, I mean, I, I don't know if I would describe it purely as, as an external pressure, but in terms of policy space, I mean, I don't, I don't think there is necessarily very much. I mean, maybe domestically it's, it's easier, but I mean, so in the case of, um, in the case of Europe, for example, I mean, I know it's not a developing country, but because it has such a large percentage of its government borrowing on financial markets, if it starts too overtly doing like financial repression policies, then, then I think like there'll be a very negative financial market reaction. And then for developing countries, I don't know, maybe it has implications for whether the IMF renews their loan or something like that. But I mean, yeah, I, yeah. No, I mean, my question is the flip side or the opposite of what John is asking. Um, and it's a question for me and the kind of vanity of my own research as well. How, how do you see global politics agreeing in a direction like this? Because unilaterally, let's say if you have the domestic pressure, or if you have the external pressure, then perhaps something can be done. But this would automatically create, in our logic of financial repression, um, a disadvantage on international scale for this country. And, and I see something like that, and I'm including myself in my own research on that, only working if you have a global homogeneous application and implementation of such. Because otherwise, you see, even in an optimal currency area like the euro, there's not homogeneity in mm. anything, any kind of financial policy. Even. So how do you see, and maybe that's a question to a political scientist, but how do you see global politics creating incentives for something like that to be designed in the only effective way, which is a global way? Yeah, I don't I guess, well, I guess, okay, if you, if you look at Chile, for example, supposedly the most neoliberal of the developing countries, even they managed to put some kind of capital controls for some periods. So I don't, I mean, I don't know, I, I, I guess, I mean, if, like, once the capital controls are there, it's not actually so bad, right? So, China, for example, it's not like the foreign investors are all scared away. In fact, it's the opposite. They're dying to go to Chinese financial markets. And they're, they still have lots of capital controls and restrictions on investment in their financial markets. So, I mean, I don't know. I, w I would think kind of the opposite, maybe, that if the, you just put like some restrictions. I mean, now I'm talking more about external restrictions. For, for domestic ones, I guess, I don't know, at least in the case of Pakistan that I study, it's not because the banks are now foreign owned. So after they were privatized, they were foreign owned. It's, it's not like politically, it's not feasible to, to put these kind of like you, because the banks are profiting heavily from their investment in government bonds. If the government puts the rate on bond yields down, they, they're going to, you lose massive profits and maybe go bankrupt. And then yeah, sure, if they were domestically owned, they could, maybe be more easily renationalized, but given their foreign owned, I don't see any way that they could be renationalized. So I guess it, I would say it depends a bit on the circumstances of each country, probably, like who, who owns the banks, what kind of interests are there in the financial sector. Yes, behind it. Could you explain a little bit of the relationship between liberalization Oh, okay. Um, okay. So I guess so. Generally, most of the most of the studies would say that after liberalization, the real interest rate, that's the the interest rate adjusted for inflation, will go up generally. And I mean, but it's not. I guess it's not so much a point of like the up or down move. It's more that in a repressed system, you have different interest rates for different things. And then in a market-based system, it's at least supposed to be like you have the central bank policy rate, and then all interest rates from there are priced at a spread to that. So it's like the, if there's more risk, the interest rate will be higher. If there's less, it will be less. But it's supposed to be kind of one market-determined interest rate, which is also called the yield curve or the interest rate structure. And generally, I guess, 
what's been the pattern is that because it's the government has kept interest rates in certain sectors very low to, to give them kind of subsidized credit. If that's all removed, then then the interest rate might go up. Yes? You know, it's just more of a comment as far as I've read in Japan and Korea and Taiwan, the government actually kept real interest rates below zero <coughs> uh, with the central bank making up the shortfall for the banks. So yeah. in that sense, of course, the moment you remove the regulation, of course, the banks will at least just for that raise interest rates. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so, so they often had yeah, like negative interest rates. And then if you have a, a profit-making bank, of course, you, you can't have negative interest rates. Alicia had a question. Um, yeah, I was wondering whether you could elaborate a little more on the um, little bit of Donna's question as well. Um, so if we consider the negative impacts of this uh, excessive liberalization, uh, is there a way that a country can turn these policies around again, or how how would a Latin American country go about improving their financial situation? Well, I, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I guess I guess that would have more to do with I don't know, like like Bamna was saying, with its bargaining power with with the IMF, or I mean, or how, as I would think, like in the balance of its domestic constituents, like who, if, I mean, of course, it's a policy choice, right, to, to liberalize in any case, so, like Argentina, if, if the domestic pressure is strong enough to reverse that, then they can, like, yeah, they're cut out from borrowing in the international financial markets, but at least so far, it's been okay. Well, I mean, there's all these uh, local, or let's say, regional development banks uh, coming up that increase their importance. Mm -hmm. Compared to the IMF, for example. Oh, so yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess so. so the BNDS would be the the main one, and that but that's only in Brazil. But then, then I read some stuff about a BRICS bank, and I guess it's I don't know how how big it is yet, but yeah, that bank of missiles. Oh, okay. yeah. So I guess yeah, yeah, sure. So yeah, so if that if that becomes a significant force, then it can kind of counterbalance the structural um, adjustment pressures from the World Bank and IMF. Yes. Uh, so who exactly is benefit, I mean it will depend on country on country, but of the international actors, who is benefiting from forcing countries to stop their financial repression policies and move towards a more liberalized market? And, and so who is benefiting from that and, and, and how specifically are they benefiting? Yeah, I mean, I like without a detailed study of all of the actors involved, I can't even begin to answer that. But I mean, I would say the obvious one, just because I I'm a bit more familiar with that, is that if uh, if countries are not opening their capital account and they're not uh, opening developing domestic financial markets, then of course institutional investors in developed countries cannot invest there. So that's I guess that's a clear one that it's. It gives them greater opportunities to invest and diversify, but I mean, that's such a complex question that I think without studying in detail everyone involved, there's no way I, I can answer that. Okay, I think we can finish at this point. Um, and thank you again, Natalia. And